I don't trust me, I'll be over it. <laughs> <laughs> that camera's really close to the back too. What, you pretend I'm I like to live life on the edge, Rex. This is the camera, but we turn the table over here. <laughs> Some of my lectures start just looking confused. <laughs> <laughs> right guys, welcome to, I guess, our second run of Applied Practice Group. We've got a couple more to go throughout the year. Um, it's quite an exciting semester, I think. We've got Yako kind of kicking us off, and then Mara and I will be reflecting on TJ2 on our time um, in various parts of Asia before we start getting international speakers in. Um, Feel free to chip in any time, obviously. Ask some great questions as always. But thanks very much for coming. I'm going to pass you on to Yako, who's going to talk about a directional step in rugby. Uh, thanks, Russ. Um, yes, yeah, a bit of a gig there to get us going. A um, bit of a laugh. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I'll be having a look at the directional step um, and trying to describe it a little bit, uh, in particular, in and rugby is my context, um, but we'll have a bit of a discussion about that later and open it up to other sports and so on as well. Um, when I talk about the directional step, I'm discussing a starting, a starting movement. So traditionally we've looked at linear starts with the parallel starts, false steps, um, uh, staggered starts, stuff like that. I want to have a little look at what happens when you start to go sideways. Um, so it's a parallel start, but a lateral movement, either left or right. Um, why rugby? Why have I started on rugby? Mainly because that's my background. Um, that's what I've done a lot of my stuff in, and that's something that I can relate the movement back to. Um, I know there are a lot of sports, a lot of other sports around where it is relevant. Um, and uh, definitely later on in this presentation, there'll be time for discussion, and I encourage that discussion. So please, as many questions as you can, come up with them, um, and we'll talk about about where else it might be. Um, and on that point, very much this, I want this to work as a discussion, um, so everything you can, feed it back, and I want to be able to design the best product I can out of this, and the best research um, within our means. Um, so my first, first point of contact is, is what I'd like to know. So why am I doing this, what I'm trying to find out, and what I'm trying to convey. Um, so, I want to compare forwards and backs, so that first little slide was an intro and maybe some of the differences between forwards and backs. Uh, just note that Greg is forward. Um, so I want to comp uh, compare between forwards and backs because we've, a lot of research suggests that there's large variations between the forwards and backs physiologically, um, physical stature, size, weight, height, um, how they play, the different demands of the games, um, again, mental and physical. Um, and, and the type of movements they do, so everything from uh, the way they start, is, is starting from, say, a, a light jog or a standing start or um, whatever it may be. Um, there are lots of differences there. Um, the, second, uh, the second point there is to compare the dominant and non-dominant in this movement. So um, I need to just clarify there that uh, so the, I'm, I'm referring to the dominant leg as opposed to the dominant side. So if they're moving to their uh, left hand side, they are driving off their right leg. Um, so where they're in the directional step like that, if they are to react to their left, it is the right leg which is the rear leg, um, and that's the leg that I'll be considering. Um, and again, moving to their right, I'm considering the left leg as that's the rear leg or the push leg. Um, then having a look at all the, um, the variables that I'll be measuring, we'll be discussing those in a minute, um, how they cor correlate to a subsequent 10 metre sprint, um, and if they correlate. So we know in a lot of literature, um, specifically in the linear, that we're considering horizontal forces, impulses, stuff like that. The horizontal uh, forces seem to have a lot more impact on, on your go forward, on your speed, and your velocity, and those full sprint efforts. Um, and I want to have a little look at if they correlate in that start position, um, the directional step, if we're getting a similar thing there, where it's horizontal or vertical, or, or what actually is correlated to the subsequent sprint, subsequent leaders. Um, and then lastly, it's just assess reliability. I'm pretty confident we all know what reliability is, so I won't go too deep into that one. Um, 
So I did do a little bit of a pilot study for this earlier this year, which is actually how I stumbled upon the idea. Um, after discussion with Pete, um, <coughs> this is the setup I had in that. So I had the force plate in the middle, just set up there, um, and timing lights either side. So it was a two meter sprint. The reason I went for the two meter sprint in that one is because of what we're limited to in our lab. So coming back into the wall, we've got a really short period. So it's a in that situation there, it was a short sprint with a deceleration. Um, what I'm looking to adjust for this one is to have it only go in one direction and to extend that out to 10 metres. So we can actually get a solid sprint afterwards, possibly with a five metre split, to have a look at what's happening throughout that sprint and how that relates back to their start. Um, with the timing lights here, so we've got a little reaction light sitting on top. So we've got, uh, some of us may have seen on the Swift timing lights, where we can activate it on the iPad and there's a delay of two to three seconds um, before that lights up and that will be their cue to accelerate. So they will be uh, the red foot on the force plate, with the, the red foot standing on the force plate, they'll set themselves up, looking straight ahead, preferably weight centered. Um, when the light lights up, it'll be a directional step into a full sprint, 10 meter sprint, uh, 90 degrees sideways. The camera there, having a look from front on and playing with the idea of possibly having a rear view camera as well, just to see what they're doing. Um, as a couple of steps afterwards, but I'm sure whether or not that's going to um, contribute to my variables yet at this stage. Um, yeah, and we'll discuss one of the limitations later of them only moving to one direction and how that removes some of the variability or the, the reactive um, portion of, of the protocol. Um, the variables, these are a couple of things that I've that I've come up with or, or the main themes of what I want to consider um, and obviously the 10 meter time there being the main performance variable um, so how fast are they doing that 10 meters and you pull that back to the force plate data um, I want to have a look at impulses um, vertical and lateral to see what they're doing with it and, and same sorry with the forces uh, vertical and um, and that lateral to have a look at whether that start is a as a step to allow the front foot to re readjust to take off, or whether that back foot is actually a large lateral push for really strong, fast motion, which is starting the acceleration. Um, then types of peak forces, how quickly are they doing that? Is that affecting them as well? Is it more about getting time on the ground, or is it more about getting that movement time off the ground? Um, and that movement time is the second one there. So is it more about getting off that back foot and accelerating, starting with the front foot, or again, is it about getting a lot of power and force through that rear foot? Um, reaction time, um, step and stride time, and step and stride length. Obviously those last two, it would be, it would be awesome to have um, the opto jump system for that. We don't have that available, so it will be with a high-speed camera to assess those to the best of our ability that we can do with that. Um, and it is it's reasonably accurate, so I'd be pretty happy with that. Um, and just to clarify that movement time, that is from um, from the time of, of that back foot pushing to the toe off. Oh, sorry, yeah, to toe off of the front foot. So from the time we start the movement to when we're actually taking that first step and accelerating into our sprint. So that is what the movement time is in there. Um, method's pretty straightforward, I'd like 30 participants and that's to, um, to justify my, my reliability. Um, some of the literature is saying there that uh, we need approximately 30 participants plus with three trials each to get reliability data, so that's what I'm aiming for there. Um, even split between forwards and backs, again just to get a good eye on what's going on, there's no point having five forwards and, and 25 backs because obviously data is not going to be as great. Um, and those participants just need to be recreational rugby players. So if they've played this season, they happy with that. They don't need to be professionals, they don't need to be paid. And I'll discuss that as well actually in a second, um, a little bit in terms of their training history. Um, actually, I'll discuss that now. So <laughs> the, the reason behind recreation as opposed to highly trained um, participants is 
there's not a lot of literature on this. And so I don't want to see how strength and conditioning coaches have trained them to accelerate. I want to see how they do it naturally. I want to, to see what is their go-to, what are they doing? And then subsequently, how does that look? What does that do to them? Is there, are some of them taking a little false step on that back foot and is that working out better for them? Or are they just accelerating and is that working better for them? As opposed to getting participants in that have been trained to, to do, to go just straight off the ground with no little false step and getting no other data. Um, I think I'll be able to describe the movement and, and the best movement um, in that respect if I have a little bit of variation of what's going on. Um, obviously there are limitations involved to that. The force plate used for um, force measurements as discussed before, the impulses, um, time to complete forces, um, and the, yeah, basically just all the force data really. Um, the reactive stimulus, as I mentioned before, so we've got a light that lights up and that's going to be the reactive stimulus. It would be really nice to have videos and agility type setups there. It's not so applicable for us at the moment. It's not possible in, in our constraints with the lab and the fact that we can only go one direction. It's going to be pre-planned and they're going to know which direction they go. So it is visually reactive, but it's not directionally reactive. Um, yeah, and obviously semi-random. They don't know when, but they do know which way they're going to go. Um, the camera, so using 300 hertz there just to get as much info as we can and to get as close as we can. Um, by preloading I mean I want to be able to know if they're leaning over that front foot because they know they're going that direction. Are they loading up in that last couple of seconds? Because that's likely going to change what they do with their back foot and how much weight they're putting on their front foot in that first step. Um, or are they keeping it dead centre? Are they starting from that position there and moving directly? Um, yeah, and just to adjust how they adjust their centre of mass prior to and just after accelerating. Um, and then obviously the 10 metre sprint speaks to itself really. The next slide here, what research exists in the area? Um, firstly with rugby, uh, living in the country we do, lots of people are fanatical about it and there is a lot of research about it. There's also a lot of research describing the different positional groups and how they react, the two major ones being forward and, forwards and backs, which I'd like to split for this one to have a look at. Um, and then in particular, having a look at um, short accelerations and the, the starting mechanics of, of rugby players, the um, forwards seem to be stronger, okay, but particularly in that dominant leg, they are stronger, but the backs produce larger horizontal forces and they're faster over two meters. As I alluded to before, the um, the horizontal forces play a massive part in that early sprint phase, early acceleration phase, and in the um, uh, starting mechanics. So, even though force, uh, forwards are bigger and stronger, the backs tend to outproduce them just because of the way they apply their force. Um, a couple of references there. Uh, those guys have done a lot of this stuff, among others. Um, and then other research in the area uh, in terms of start. Starting mechanics, so linear starts, we know a lot about linear starts and we've, it's been researched several times. Um, specifically, uh, Cronin, uh, <coughs> Cusick and Slawinski, and that was up from 2011, 2014 and 2017. So there's been a long pattern and there's a lot in between, a lot before, no doubt a lot more to come. But there's been a pattern of people researching it. Um, and so from that parallel start, the the false start produ produces the most, um, the most force for us, the best impulses, and the best acceleration in the following meters. So if we're looking at a 10 meter sprint, that false start does give us a slightly faster time from a parallel start. However, um, we do know it is counterproductive to be productive. So we are taking the extra time to take a step before we accelerate. So our movement time in that first little area is a bit more. Um, and that's kind of what, what exists in the area, really. Um, in terms of lateral starts, there isn't much. There's a little bit of baseball around stealing bases, so a little bit of a shuffle into a sprint. There's some stuff around that, but it's not very in-depth, and it's not from that first position that we're having a look at here. So 
that's another reason why I want as much input from you guys as possible uh, from anyone who's available because there's not a lot else to draw on and I'm, I'm really picking on experience here to help me out to go forward. Um, limitations. I am completely aware that there are a lot more limitations to my study than this. These are a couple of key ones that are weighing on my mind and ones that I'd like to convey and have some discussion about. Um, so the lack of, of randomness in my reaction, um, as I said before, the light stimulus is there, they don't know when they're gonna go, but they know where they're gonna go. So it's not completely agility, I can't, I can't relate it back to agility. There might be some stuff there to talk about in terms of change of direction speed, but um, I realize it's not agility, and maybe, maybe not even change of direction speed, maybe it is just very specific to the movement that it is. Um, and no doubt I'll, I'll find more of it. I'll find out more about that as it goes. Um, and then alongside that is that preload that I was talking to you about before. If they are going to preload, or if they're going to lean one way or the other way prior to the light coming on, that's going to make a big difference, I think, to the data I do get. Um, also, the, the lack of training age, I know I've said that I prefer that. I prefer them not to be trained. But at the same time, anyone who's untrained and who's going out there to do something for the first few times, even if they do get a, a warm up and a um, familiarization run, um, you, they're still going to be learning, they're still going to be changing things, and it's not going to be consistent because it's not something that's that drilled into their mind. All of a sudden, they're not just doing it, they're thinking about doing it. So that lack of training, um, training age is going to influence me a little bit. Um, and yeah, the lack of professionalism, they are just players on the weekend and they do get lazy sometimes or they do, yeah, you see them on the field when they're missing tackles, it's not always because they're not that good, it's just because they get lazy and there is a possibility that, that that gets dragged into the study. Greg's smiling as if he's done that before. <laughs> <laughs> I need someone to pick up. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this just kind of brings me to the end of my presentation. I've flown through it a little bit because I want to put a lot of weight on what you guys think and what I need help with. Um, so uh, the relevance of my application to it, um, putting it into the rugby, um, the rugby area where it's, it is from a standing start, and there is a lot of research to say that it's not always a standing start. Rugby quite often is a moving start. I have anecdotal evidence that there is a lot of standing start and a very, very lateral movement as opposed to forward before a turn, um, especially in, in, the, in and around the ruts, the really tight stuff, which the forwards would be more um, applied to. So in that discussion there, I'd like to open it up to you guys in a minute to bring in anything else, anywhere else. I know there's a lot of it in hockey. I've seen it trained in um, netball and hockey extensively. So France and Lynn, I know you two might both have some input for me there. Um, so by all means, any suggestions and experience there would be appreciated. Um, the definition of the movement. So due to the lack of scientific writing on it, a lot of the stuff, a lot of my, I suppose, defining the movement does come from coaches' blogs and forums and stuff like that without uh, referring to it as a directional step. But there seem to be variances on a directional step. So your guys' input on is it a directional step, or do I need to take a step back and, and consider how I how I word it and, and where I place it and where I define it, the specific movement that I'm looking at? Um, then that third point incentives to draw participants. So again, these guys aren't professional; they're not being told by the coaches they have to turn up to get 30 participants just by asking is a challenge in itself. Um, and then to, to get them to put in a big effort is the second challenge. So if there's anything that I could possibly um, suggest to them as incentives or reasons why they should come, that would be an awesome discussion to have as well. And then finally, what have I missed? What have you guys picked up that I haven't thought of? What have you picked up that I am doing wrong possibly or that needs some work and, and refining? Um, I'd be more than happy to have plenty of questions and answers about that. Um, so yeah, that's me done talking, pretty much. Um, so I'd like to open it up to everyone. I see Regan's got about a page and a half worth of notes there. <laughs> really excited for me, thanks mate. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, either that or he hasn't been paying attention. Um, so yeah, by all means, I'll open it up to you guys now for, for questions and discussion and suggestions.
Nice job, mate. Just, just to be clear, it wasn't my not wanting to make a tackle, it was just too slow to make a tackle. Okay, right, so we need to get some training on this three. I'm not sure it was a direction of step the whole mechanism of running. The whole movement. Right. Regan, do you want to start us off with one of yours? Yeah. Uh, my concern is around the. Uh, so, so you mentioned that it would be the rear foot only on the fourth plate? Yep. My concern is with people, and I, I don't know anything about it, but I'm assuming it'll probably be sport dependent, mm -hmm. um, whether or not you would use front foot load or rear foot load. Sure. So think about myself personally, and this is where it came from, I think I'm a front foot loader, and that comes from a track background, I guess. I don't know what happened in rugby, but I might be taught different, but if they are a front foot loader, the faster guys are not going to have the higher force outputs, are they? No, no, it's, yeah based on the, the rear foot being on the plane. Yeah. So how, what, what's that going to do to your data? Um, I think that, to be honest, comes back to my participant selection and why I've decided to go for rugby as a team sport because one, I've, I've isolated a group of people being rugby players who should be similar and you should be that centre load because they never know whether they're going to go left or right. They set up in a defensive line and they will have to react left or right. So, um, I, I guess I guess I'm addressing it from from the point of the cohort that I want to analyze first before I draw it out, um, and I'm also restricted with what I can do with our force plate. So mm. in the pilot setup, I did have them two feet on the force plate, yeah. and what happened? Yeah, what happened there is, is that the, some of them would take a little false step on the back foot, and rugby players, being rugby players, are quite big. They'd yeah. actually be off the force plate or partially off the force plate. Yeah. Um, and the second thing is that they hadn't finished force production on the rear foot by the time they had touched down on the front foot so you lost a big chunk of data in terms of your impulses on what was actually happening with that back foot so definitely that is a limitation yeah what's well, um, to stop you measuring both front foot and back foot independent two force plates the one look so so one you so one trial or one yep. trial three oh, you're yeah, measuring yeah. just back foot and then you get them back in for three more to measure just front foot Sure. Um, this is a discussion I had with Pete, and it's it's a difficulty around comparing two separate trials and arriving at the same destination. So I, I, it has been done, and I've seen sprint trials where they've tried to get, say, 40 metres <coughs> to sprint by using 10 metre segments. So it is doable. It is definitely possible, but it's difficult to to do that solidly and scientifically. Um, I think possibly it would be two different studies coming to, coming from it the way I am coming from it. I'd like to do that in two different studies and go, I know what happens on the back foot, so now let's have a look at what happens on the front foot. I um, guess to add in there, the, the, the task execution at hand would not directly be replicated mm. from measuring those two situations, yeah. and that's a, that's a bit of concern. Because yeah. so. the other one around that, are you going to standardise their, their leg split? Because the closer or further apart, yeah. depending how stand out, will, depend, will change the foot they load. So a wider stance versus a narrow stance, I think you're more predisposed to going either real or front foot, just by how you cool. set up. Okay. Yeah. I think, um, you know, Yako's talked about habitual um, movement pattern here, and, and so that predetermined by them has a, plays quite a role in the habitualness of the movement. But even if it's something just like point. shoulder work, yeah. you know what I mean? Because if someone's standing there like this, just because that's how they decide to stand at the time, versus now going here on the next trial, it's going to change the way they load, I reckon that. And then, I, and then to, add, to, to refute that, I think the matter of by telling someone to stand in a certain way is already going to directly change the, the movement pattern they'd be accustomed to use. So it's something to take on board, and I think you need to run a pilot on that. Just to iron, I think it's a good point you bring up. Could you say, but, uh, yeah. could you just go, if you, for each person, you say, I'll stand comfortably, mm -hmm. and then you take it, you just do a tape measure put two bits of tape there so then per person it's a bit it's like another yeah it increases your setup time slightly but then that person you presume is going to be quite consistent each time they come in the lab but you've got so okay so in terms of having them reproduce their trial every time yeah possibly yeah because is that still habitual if it's measured yeah, to yeah. them yep individualize that i think that it links well into rig's point um yeah look Look into that. That's it, yeah, that's something I'll look into. And this is this exactly what I want from this discussion, is more things to look into. So I'm not going to say yes or no to all your answers, but 
that's the most one I'm right now. What's been interesting is to see what posture is. Posture? And to just see that while they lower, to the gravity, are they yeah. and together? Because that's also going to in terms of In terms of here? Yeah. 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 Upright or being yeah. more yeah. bent or tilt um, Segment angles is something that I um, have on the, the fringe, range, fringes to assess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it's just kind of a case at the moment of how do I go about that and is it, is it going to fit into my time frame and is it, um, is it reliably doable with the setup that I have available? Do you have, yeah. Yeah. Um, most of it comes down to can I get a second camera? <laughs> can I get a second uh, high speed camera? Um, kind of similar to the first one. Only 50 grams on a flash boost, does it? What markers are you going to put on people? Um, so at this stage, none. Because. Um, so if we go back to the slide. At this stage, my only real thing that I'm doing with the camera is the um, step and stride and uh, time and length um, and that movement time. Um, so a lot of that is basically just to do with the feet, so it's just toe off. Um, and with that, I think you, like you could do what we sort of do with the parkour stuff. You can have that, that qualitative visual thing where you know, they took that step where you saw the front load and you can have that table there as well. So we to have some data around that just by looking at the camera footage. Sure. I think. Oh, sorry. There you go. Oh. Um, I think it will be because it's describing the movement from such a basic perspective, just because it hasn't been done many, very many times before. That there will be a lot of qualitative analysis. Um, how much of that really ends up in the write-up will be determined by what impact it has. But I think there will be a big, a big learning part of it with, with having a look at what they do. <coughs> What happens afterwards? And one of the major concerns with measuring any type of spatial metric, whether it be a length or an angle, is that if you've got one camera set up perpendicular to like how we've got the Yarko here, Yarko is not always going to be perfectly perpendicular to the space now. And so if he's at 30 degrees when he turns versus 45, we'll never ever be able to exactly measure those angles with one camera. Yeah. So but you can just see, it doesn't matter what the angle is, you can see whether they load the front foot or load the back foot yep. and take a step back. And that could then justify looking into something in the future. You know, we saw most people were front foot type of thing. So it's a recommendation, easy table to see. Oh, cool, and I think coming back to that, you know, what the point you're raising there around, you know, with the habitualness of the people and what they're doing, that's something we just had a conversation about earlier. Yeah, okay, and, and how and how he's progressing, wanting to look at are they false starters, are they non-false starters, and then go, hey, man, 80% of people naturally want to take their step backwards, yet we, were, we prevent them from doing that, yeah. and what is the rationale for preventing them from that? And the only rationale I'm seeing at the moment is the fact that it increases movement time, <clears throat> but everything else is positive. See, it's one detrimental context versus a number of positive contexts then go, okay, then is it, is it task specific, i.e., if I've got to beat Yarko, um, or I've got to respond to Yarko filling my space mm. and, and tactically, then maybe doing that back false step's not ideal because I'm taking another mm. third of a second to do it. Mm. But if I don't have to respond to that, then maybe doing the false step's going to maybe move faster. Because looking at some of that literature, you know, the Frost and Cronin's from back in the late um, 2000s, Everything is looking at about a 0.5 to about a 2.8% enhancement when you're looking at 2.5 metres to 10 metres. And as an enhancement, that's pretty pretty impressive to use a false step. I think the other thing you've touched on there, Regan, is the um, future recommendations. I think a lot of this, a lot of what I'm trying to get out of here is what next. So this is very much a basic study, I admit that, in terms of the limitations I have, um, but it, it will tell us, or it will tell me at least a lot about what next, where do I go next, what do I need to isolate, what do I need to attack to really get data out of it. Do you think any of that would change if you had someone holding the ball? Yes, yep. Yeah. Um, definitely. So yeah, there is actually research on that, and I used that one of my sons a couple of months ago on um, how to sprint. If I remember the study correctly, it was a short sprint effort and how holding the ball changes mechanics in a short sprint effort. Um, a lot to do with the arm swing, as you can imagine, and the ability to, to connect the core to the hips um, and to the legs to get acceleration. So, yeah, the ball, the type of sport and the type of equipment you use would have a big, play a big factor.
have you thought about how you would actually, what sort of cues or what sort of instructions you would give to stop that preloading? Like I see you mentioned it before. No. <laughs> you give them no instruction. Just run. Oh, just as well. Yeah. Because no, they know, they know yeah. it's going to go that way. So certainly, I think um, I think there is another pilot to be had here before I do before I do it because it's, it is quite a different um, situation from what we did. It is and it isn't. But I think there is definitely another pilot to be had here before I make that decision to see how many people do preload, how much do they preload, and is it something they need to address? Are there a few key points that aren't going to affect their natural movement too much, but that's going to keep them doing what I actually need them to do? Yeah, yell at them in the last second. <laughs> would, you, would you expect? Do you expect the faster guys to have the faster times over the 10th? Yep. Makes sense, right? Yep, faster sprints is faster time. So my question is, do you need to go to full 10th? Because really we know that after that sorry, sort of first, second, third step, we're going to get into that 10 metre. Yep. And if, if you didn't, does that then open you up to the ability to go either way based on your action? Go to 5 metre. I like that. Yeah, even, even, even though it's like you still talked about 2 metres, yep. and that's sort of the first two steps. So the reason I wanted to extend it from two meters is because that's not much time for untrained people to show any kind of difference. It's taken a couple of steps. I I, I believe I don't know. I'm more than happy for you guys to interrupt there. Um, definitely, I think five meters would be awesome. Maybe a five meter split and a ten meter sprint. I just want to see as much as I can. Really, maybe maybe a two or five and a ten. Yeah, because I think that reaction split is very important if you if you truly wanted to take out that sort of that mm -hmm. bias towards one side zone and going that side versus in getting that, that posture upright and you could go this way, you could go this way. From that point of view, yeah. the short one might actually take away a bit of the limitation for And Yako and I talked about this and we talked about the um, health and safety yeah. aspects in the lab. Yeah. Yeah. And I thought it'd be um, unwise for the health and safety monitor person to be <laughs> going outside the bounds of health and safety. Um, hence, in his first, in his schematic, he had a, a 2.5 distance which he was using, using with the um, Japanese boys, yeah. and that safely could be done because it allowed about two to three meters to slow down before they hit the wall, mm. um, but you could still get a decent time there. Yeah. So these have been one of the logistical headaches we've had to work through. But it would be, as, as um, Yako has alluded to, making it a pure agility task with the cognitive reaction yeah. state would definitely be awesome. Mm -hmm. um, we are just limited, limited by space. So. I'm just going to worry if it really is going to be uh, a real fly in the ointment. Because if you've only got 2.3 metres to slow down, are you actually going to get maximum force? Yeah, no, I don't think so. And, and so that's why, for that's me, yeah. that actually puts a big question mark. That's mind. why we yeah. moved away from that to then going 10 metres out the door. So if we the imagine, direction. If we imagine on this slide that the wall is here, which is the pilot setup that I ran, or not, you know, maybe there, um, we've taken this half of the setup out, and this sprints out onto the track, and so we've extended that out to, and that's the head back around the one person. And then when they go to the right, that would be the setup, and then we Flip the camera over to the other side and then they're going to the left side for safety. It's more specific to make a tackle someone <laughs> two, two meters out. Well, I was thinking that though, because how often do most people run 10, 10 meters. meters off a step like this in a game? Yeah. That, that's no, that. yeah, and that's, I think that links into the discussion we had before. Maybe I do need more, um, more splits in between to see where the difference is occurring. Um, yeah. To see if and then, and then to justify after that, if it's a two meter acceleration, yes or no, it makes a difference. If it gets out to 10 meters, yes or no, it makes a difference. So if it doesn't make a difference until 10 meters, maybe it's not really applicable, maybe it doesn't yeah. really matter as much. But if it's gonna be making a difference within the first two meters, then yes, maybe it is something we really need to consider. What's your, what does your second step look like? You know what I mean? So is it crofty? Have you got that cross step? Um, just a second step being lead leg or yeah, like that. So, no, you do you do that? Yeah, 
So um, that's going to be individualised again, I think, uh, and that'll be part of seeing what do they do in that qualitative analysis and what do they naturally go to, and, and possibly which one of those actually does end up making or leading to the faster times. You know, which guys are producing the faster times? Is it the guys who are getting a um, a good vertical push to have enough time to get that front foot down, or is it just a case of a massive shove off that back foot and then no, see what they do after that? Yeah. I do believe that first five meters is the most important, though, especially if we're looking at not necessarily the outcome 10 meters, but the outcome five, which was the thing acceleration. I think it's maybe up to five. Yeah, we've got the lights. It's not going to change, but you know. No. Yeah. Yeah. We've got the lights to do like a two, five, and ten or something. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, logistical thing. When does the student finish? When and how far out of the season will they be doing this? Hopefully within two to three weeks. Okay. They won't be losing too much function. No. Because you've got guys who keep training, you've got guys who don't. Yeah. So, yeah, definitely that is. Another limitation we're going to need to add in here. Yeah. It won't be in season, it'll be just post season. Um, for some guys, it depends who's played finals and who hasn't really. Yeah. But even then, there'll be players who are coming to the end of their season now, and all the training that they're doing is on Tuesday and Thursday night. For this cohort, that would be probably yeah. 30%. That'd be it. That'd be it. <laughs> yeah. Is this the under 85 marathon? <laughs> Unless you've got a few extra players with me, Greg, by all means send them down. I don't know, he's under 85 catches. <laughs> <laughs> no, so this will be open now. Um, I'm hoping to open this up to the, to my team, to the uh, under 21s. Um, and to uh, be honest, any other teams I can get access to if I can send it out through clubs and that. Um, anyone and everyone. Um, I'll have a look at an eight band, get that in. I'd like to see the difference between different athletes from different sports though. Yeah. And that's that's the future. Yeah, I think it's quite you know, like tennis applicable really. Yeah, yeah. Very, very like in terms of distance and everything. And and the movement of the lateral. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's something that I'll put a lot of time into with the rugby thing is to actually justify a standing start from rugby with a ninety degree turn. So I've seen it happen, I know it happens. Um, but it's difficult to justify without research behind it for for me to say, hey look, these guys have, have done their video analysis and they've written it up and here's my piece, you know, here's my thing. I am in a position to do some of that analysis, uh, hopefully soon. But again it won't be the justification is going to be a big part for me to get that right and to nail it down. Yeah. And that's that's why I thought I'd open it up especially to France and, and Lynn because um, it's also very applicable in, in hockey at netball um, with the ball going to the side by the top ball. And probably they, they have to make those moves for real. So yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so tennis, any rapid sports, hockey, netball. I think in the first instance, though, it's really important to get one cohort, <laughs> one sporting group, just so that we don't get um, different influences from different sports. Yeah. Um, so that's why I've stuck with one for now, early on. Do you think you see difference if you looked at, because you're obviously just looking at male athletes, do you think it'd be a difference if you? And female athletes. Sure, it would be there's around good. like hip angle and yeah. joint laxity, and there's quite a few, yeah. mm. I guess, biochemical and biomechanical factors. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I think it's probably, in the first instance, it is important to, um, for me to isolate it to get an idea, then to compare, as opposed to trying to mix it up. Um, oh, no, not because, great, like, yeah, yeah not, not because I don't want to mix it up, but more because the level that I'm working at here and what I'm trying to achieve. I think that is that's maybe the next step up from where I'm looking at now. Is that what this plan is? Information gather now and then use it to serve us on the future? Yeah, I mean, it's, I suppose at the end of the day it's the point of any research, isn't it? Um, I think maybe I've just stumbled upon something that, that's very early on. Um, and so, yeah. <laughs> Future cow to have someone running towards you and you could react to which way. Oh, exactly, yeah. 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 <laughs> what a cow. A computer on wheels. There's a video looping on it. Yeah, we're not doing that. What a bull. Struggle with ethics for that one, man. Have we got any other? Anything else? Put them in a room and narrow. Major's a fun way of doing agility. I think that's, you know, 